What are the challenges and rewards of narrating Palestine from the perspective of an outsider who has integrated with Palestinian society? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Moin Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Alison Glick and Nora Lester Murad. Alison Glick is a writer and activist currently based in Philadelphia. She previously lived in the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and Yarmouk camp in Syria, working as a teacher, human rights researcher, and freelance writer. Her first novel, The Other End of the Sea, was published this month by Interlink Books. Nora Lester Murad is a writer and active, is a scholar and activist who writes about international aid, community philanthropy, and life under military occupation. Her work has appeared in The Guardian, Al Jazeera.net, Mondo Weiss, and various academic and professional publications. She co-authored Rest in My Shade, a poem about roots, and is the editor of I Found, I Found Myself in Palestine, both also published by Interlink Books. Her tween novel is set in Jerusalem and will come out next year. Alison Glick and Nora Lester Murad, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. I'd like, great. I'd, I'd like to begin by exploring your personal journeys. How did each of you end up in Palestine? Was this a personal or political journey or were the personal and political two sides of the same coin? Alison, perhaps uh, we can begin with you and also take this opportunity to congratulate you on the publication of The Other End of the Sea. Thanks so much, Moyne. I really appreciate it. Um, for me, it was a personal journey that became political, but that eventually ended up being, as you put it, um, both sides, uh, one side of the, both sides of the same coin. Um, I was in high school when I first went to the region. Um, I spent a summer in Israel, and during that time, um, I got a whiff of the racism in the country, but didn't have, as a 17-year-old, the political and historical analysis and language to really understand what was going on. Um, so I, when I went back um, after graduating from high school and spent six months on a kibbutz, that's when um, I would say the apartheid nature of the state really began to sink in. And um, I came back to the United States, started university in March of 1982. Um, three months later, uh, the Israelis invaded Lebanon. There was the siege of Beirut, Sabra and Shatila massacre happened. I started meeting uh, Palestinians and other Arabs, international students at university, reading Said and uh, Noam Chomsky. The, it all just really rocked my world. So um, I had this transformation that um, ended up with my studying Middle East history. And as soon as I graduated from university, I went back to the uh, region, this time to live in the West Bank. Um, I spent three years in the West Bank in Gaza and then three years in Yarmouk camp, as you mentioned, um, after I married a Palestinian from Gaza who, was, who went into exile. Um, so and this that, was all during the 1980s, I believe. Yes, I was there um, my first, Summer there uh, was in 1980, and then I lived in Palestine and Syria from 1986 uh, to 92, and came back to the United States at that point um, in 1992. So that was my trajectory mm -hmm. and how it all became intertwined, the, the personal and the political, as it almost always is. It often is. You're, you're quite right. And uh, Nora, what about uh, your trajectory? Was it, did it follow? A very similar path to Allison's. Um, were were there uh, let's say elements that set it apart? Well, I would say uh, my journey has been at first political, and then continued to be political while also becoming personal. Um, I grew up in a, a family of social justice activists in California. And I think as a family, we were quite involved in working against racism and for social justice for immigrants and uh, 
unhoused people. And that kind of led me in college to be interested in the anti-apartheid movement. That was the South African apartheid that we were concerned about at the time. And uh, I decided I wanted to see it for myself. That's kind of my personality. I, I want to see something if I'm going to really commit myself to it. And I traveled towards <laughs> South Africa via my host family in France, who diverted me to Israel. Uh, they thought that um, South Africa would be dangerous and they had friends they wanted to send me to in Israel and they bought me a non-refundable ticket. Hmm. When I think back at how significant it was, the ticket was non-refundable <laughs> and how that changed my entire life is pretty amazing. But somehow because it was non-refundable, I just went there. Um, I had, of course, as a Jew growing up, heard about Israel, but my family were not Zionists. I didn't really know much at all. I didn't really understand there was a conflict, but uh, it was immediately apparent to me that something was very wrong. Uh, I spent six, Israel, six weeks there in Israel and went back to Los Angeles, changed my major to Middle East studies and ended up um, uh, registering for a study abroad year in Cairo, followed by a second year abroad in Jerusalem. So different but similar, uh, in between my two years abroad, I met my Palestinian husband, and that um, was like 35 years ago or something, of course, made the politics continue, but also added the personal uh, dimension. Uh, we also lived in Palestine and raised our three daughters there in Jerusalem and Ramallah over about 13 years. Um, and I uh, worked and did activism work while I was there and since then as well. And what, what I find interesting about both your stories is that it was very much influenced by actually um, uh, spending time there. Because when I think back about many of your peers um, uh, growing up during the same period, they could on the one hand have very progressive politics but then also often make an exception um, for, for Israel. Whereas in your case, what sets you apart, I think, is um, physically witnessing situation, the situation that existed on the ground. In, in your views, um, did this have kind of a, um, a disproportionate impact that, you, that might not have had that impact if you would have been simply watching it on TV or, or reading about it? Um, Allison, maybe I can start with you again. Sure, absolutely. Um, especially as a naive young uh, teenager uh, traveling around Israel, um, not really understanding what I was seeing. The first time I went to a Palestinian village inside Israel and saw the Jim Crow-like conditions that citizens, supposedly equal citizens of the state were living in compared to what I saw the summer before when living in a Jewish town, um, I was just shocked. I, again, I didn't have that political language, other, but all I could think was Jim Crow South. I knew that much and I knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. And I also knew that I hadn't been told something, maybe a lot of something. So, um, you know, there's a saying that I picked up along the way. I don't certainly take credit for it. What you see, you cannot unsee. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you, of course, do with what you see is, is ultimately, um, you know, the important thing. But that, that, was, um, that was an education. Uh, in many, many ways. And it, it really did change the trajectory of my life. I, I think it's fair to say. And, and Nora, what I find um, interesting about what Allison just said is, you know, she went to a um, Arab village and a Jewish town within Israel. I mean, one, one only needs to reflect on the concept of Arab village and, and Jewish town. Uh, but nevertheless, um, that, that this transformation um, occurred as a result of things she saw and experienced 
only within Israel's borders. It's, it wasn't because she went to uh, Gaza or the West Bank. And I'm wondering, in your case, um, was it similar or did you also, at, during that first um, visit, go to the occupied territories, for example? Uh, I did. Uh, it was different then, uh, but I don't think it was the difference uh, between the Palestinian areas and the Jewish areas that struck me. Um, I don't remember. It was a long time ago, all the details of it. But what I remember so vividly was my first experience being almost constantly and relentlessly sexually harassed. They, I have never felt so unsafe, physically unsafe in my life as I did those first six weeks that I was in Israel. And um, when I would at youth hostels comment on it, the first thing people would say was, was he Arab or Jewish? And I was like, I don't know. How am I supposed to know? Right? <laughs> How am I supposed to know? And then they'd say, well, was he speaking Arabic or Hebrew? And I would say, I don't know. How am I supposed to know? And I think I was just really, really struck by why this was so very important to everybody. It only took a little bit more uh, probing and, and, and research for me to understand for the first time that I was implicated. Uh, I had always felt implicated in racism as a white person in the United States and, you know, acted on that feeling of, of uh, responsibility uh, by doing anti-racism work. It was in Israel that I felt implicated as a Jew and uh, maybe switched or adjusted my social justice priorities so that while I'm still a very multi-issue person, Palestine does take quite a high priority for me as a human being, as a US tax paper, pa payer, as a Jew, and now as the mother of Palestinian Muslim girls, which is you know, a whole new level or kind of in, entrenchment, if you will, in right. the situation. And um, Nora, if, if uh, I can continue with you um, on, on a different subject now, you edited a book um, called I Found Myself in Palestine, in which about 20 authors discuss what you term the complexities of being a foreigner in Palestine. Um, why did you feel the need to produce this book? Well, I think I felt a need to write and think through and to understand my own story um, and quickly realized that I didn't want to do it by myself. Um, there were interesting commonalities, but also profound differences uh, between my experience as a foreigner and other foreigners that I knew uh, who lived in Palestine or for whom Palestine was an important part of their lives. And I because if I can just uh, interrupt, uh, the, the authors you collect in this volume really come from all over with um, uh, an entire range of, uh, of backgrounds in every sense of the term. Absolutely. They're from all over the world. They have lots of different relationships to Palestine. Some work, some are part of Palestinian families. Um, uh, some have a religious connection. But I think what ultimately was the qualification that, uh, that got somebody into the book is that they themselves were transformed by Palestine. Uh, because I think in the beginning, uh, what was clear was that none of us wanted to speak on behalf of Palestinians or to have Palestine perceived through our lenses. We were very aware of the risk of doing that, the harm that that would cause. And in order to resist that uh, possibility, we did not write about Palestine. We wrote about ourselves and how we were transformed by Palestine, not how 
Palestine was somehow affected um, by us. So that was a little a little twist. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah. So I was, if if you could perhaps um, clarify a little what what you mean when you say um, we were transformed by Palestine. Are you speaking about um, personal? Um, experiences, uh, changes in, in political perspective, career trajectories? All of those things. Um, but what's, what's, what's a common thread through everybody's story is that with Palestine, there's a point at which you can, it's what Allison said, it, you, things that are seen can't be unseen. Um, the, the, the hegemonic narrative of Palestine is such that when we see things more clearly, when we see through that, you know, attempt to mystify reality, um, it becomes uh, in some ways kind of uh, lonely, really. Um, you can't quite ever talk to people who you knew before who don't see it the way you do quite in the same way, and they don't see you in the same way. Um, it's, it is transformational, um, I think, politically, intellectually, and personally in, in, in that way. I think that's something that we all shared um, as foreigners who had been transformed. And um, Allison, you initially drafted an autobiography uh, but then upon the recommendation of your uh, publisher at uh, Interlink, you transformed it into a novel, uh, the one that's just out called uh, The Other End of the Sea. Could you tell us a bit about your um, novel and, and also why is it a novel rather than an autobiography in the, at the end of the day? Sure. Well, first, just a little bit about the book. Um, it's, it's a love story. Um, writ large. And uh, the through line of the book is this relationship between Rebecca and Zayn. Uh, Rebecca is initially called Becky in the book. Um, and when at which point she becomes Rebecca is, I think, something for readers to think about. But anyway, so it's a through line of a love story, um, off of which I hang the backstories of Zayn and Rebecca. Um, their families, their, uh, of course, their personal histories, their, um, their experiences uh, uh, that lead them to, to meet, I, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, eventually, you know, of course, they marry, um, Zane goes into exile, and they end up in Damascus in Yarmouk. That rings a bell. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um, and it's about how, uh, you know, their relationship um, is impacted by all of the events surrounding their relationship. Uh, exile, um, living in a refugee camp, uh, withstanding um, the political turmoil that's unfolding around them. And then they have a daughter um, and the impact on a relationship for even the strongest of marriages is such that you, um, it doesn't bode well, bode well for their future as a couple, but somehow I'm they remain a family. Uh, and I don't wanna give too much away, um, but uh, in my view- Buy and read um, the book. I'll read the book I'll, and you I strongly uh, I very strongly uh, recommend it. Um, so that's you know a little bit of a summary and um, one of the to answer your other question and to relate why a memoir became a novel one of the goals I have with this book is to get it into the hands of people who um, are not already converted so to speak who don't already um, understand the realities in Palestine um, the way that that I think we all do, um, because I think that that's just that's really important. I um, I thought it was interesting that your one of your earlier shows, Zach Foster, um, said the same thing about uh, why he wrote 
his book in the, or his dissertation in the way that he did. Anyway, I think it's important to speak beyond the choir. Mm -hmm. So when my editor suggested fictionalizing it, um, I first kind of freaked out because I never saw myself as a fiction writer. But then he said, you know, you know, Allison, more general readers will be reached by a novel set in the Middle East than by a piece of nonfiction about the Middle East. And that got my attention. Right. So um, I once I started actually doing it, thinking about how to do it, um, I realized that I could do a lot of things um, in fiction that I couldn't necessarily do in nonfiction, that, that the narrative really could open up and that people who know very little about the region could begin to identify with the characters and identify with their situation because maybe they can identify with the story of you know a multicultural relationship or intercultural relationship with um you know a struggling marriage and how do you deal with that when you have children with um unfair and unjust and often cruel immigration practices right so i think there are ways to uh i also wanted to protect the identities of the people whose lives intersected with mine who uh, who, who fed the narrative of uh the re those relationships from which i draw very heavily in the book so that was important and fictionalization obviously helped me to do that um and ultimately i found the process freeing um, I found that I could experience a kind of creative thrill that I never had before by creating narrative arcs uh, for these characters. And in one instance, again, I'm not going to go into many details, creating arcs that make inan inanimate objects characters in the story, which is one part of the story that I absolutely love and was not there originally. So it was rewarding in a way that I didn't anticipate. Um, and I hope it will be educational for people who would not otherwise have read my memoir. Well, that it certainly is. And um, it's it's really a, a fascinating how you describe uh, the process and, and the transformation from your memoir into uh, a novel. And if I could um, now turn to you, Nora, with a slightly um, uh, different question. You're now completing a uh, tween novel um, set in Jerusalem. And um, what are the complexities of, of an adult um, writing such a novel and, and the added dimension of um, setting it in, uh, in Jerusalem? Well, that's a great question. The novel is actually set both in Cambridge, Massachusetts and in Jerusalem, um, writing for an English speaking audience and probably mostly a US based audience. It's really a, 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 a literary trick, I guess, to start in the US and kind of paint the picture that a US reader would be familiar with and then have that person travel uh, to the Middle East and see things then through new eyes. Um, in, in the case of this book, uh, it was written while my kids were absolutely obsessed with not only the Harry Potter books, but also the Percy Jackson books, which um, have are, are grounded in, in, in mythology and culture, but also magic. Um, and because my kids loved magic and loved books, and I wanted my kids to love my books, um, I also integrated uh, magic. You just in, gave it away. <laughs> into, uh, into this story as well. So it starts with a Palestinian American girl who was born in Cambridge, whose parents moved to Cambridge as students and then stayed. And her, um, her backstory is my daughter's backstory, where here in Newton, Massachusetts, as a Palestinian American, she felt uh, that just saying that she was Palestinian was perceived as threatening or confrontational or even violent. And um, 
her struggle in, in, in this town where I live in Newton, Massachusetts, to try to help adults and kids, but the folks around her in her school understand how racism and Islamophobia affected her ability to, to be happy and to learn in the school setting became the backstory for the character. So um, the girl is in Cambridge. She is um, treated poorly at her school um, and switches schools, wanting to be invisible, wanting not to be Palestinian, which is something I did see sometimes in my kids at various times in various places. Um, and then in her desire to escape being Palestinian, she ends up in Palestine through magic, but not, um, but she is in Palestine in the life she would have had if her pa parents had never moved. So she's there, but her parents are there and her sisters are there and her grandparents who she had never met and her aunts and uncles who she had never met were all there. And she has some experiences there that are exciting and scary and belonging and no belonging and all of that ends up accidentally transporting back and learning how the portal works. And once you know how the portal works, you have to choose. Mm -hmm. And that's really the whole rest of the book is how do you choose between two places, between two versions of yourself, between two places that are both affirming in some ways, but also frightening in some ways. And so uh, the book ends up being not just a coming of age story about a girl finding her bicultural identity, but really specifically a Palestinian girl learning how to advocate for herself as a Palestinian and to hold her classmates, her teachers and administrators accountable for an anti-racist uh, education. Well, if she succeeds in holding administrators accountable, it really is a magical book. <laughs> and it, it will be uh, published by Interlink as well, I believe. Um, yes. Do you, do you already have a title or are we getting ahead of ourselves? Well, well we have about 10 different titles to choose from, but anybody okay. who's, who's listening who wants to weigh in, I think it is about time to go for a vote. <laughs> Great. Um, the, girl's well, name is, uh, the girl's name is Ida. And uh -huh. so one of the possible titles is Ida Returns, uh, because, in fact, she does return in so many different ways uh, through the book. Very to the point, I should add, Ida Returns. Um, I'd, I'd like to return now once again to your um, uh, personal experiences. You're both American Jewish women who married into Palestinian families and um, for a time at least also lived in Palestine and in Allison's case uh, in Syria as well. Did being American and Jewish in this context produce particular challenges, difficulties, privileges, responsibilities, perhaps a combination of, of these factors? Um, Allison, if I could turn to you first. Sure. Um, in terms of difficulties while living there, um, the the main reactions or challenges I had uh, that uh, were difficult to deal with sometimes would be from Israelis, particularly Israeli soldiers, um, because I, I think that they would often be confused or angry as to, you know, why is someone with the last name Glick here? You're not supposed to be here. Um, Wrong side and, of the tracks wrong side of the tracks and um i think that you know there was somehow threatened by it i don't know it, i mean there was a a lot of different reactions and um of course they have them because they are you know prisoners of their own narrative that wrongly says that oh you know jews live here and and palestinians live here and as if there was not this rich long history of of Christians and Jews and Muslims uh, and others living together uh, in this land. Um, so that was that was the most challenging thing, uh, thing and it took different uh, different forms. Um, of course, 
So as a Jew and as an American, I was afforded a lot of privileges, mostly mobility. Um, I could get in and out of places that, or I, I used to be able to get in and out of places that Palestinians cannot. Um, you know, to this day in visits, I, I, I uh, reap the benefits of that privilege, of course. Uh, and um, so, it, but responsibility is, I mean, I, I guess I would just echo what I said earlier. I feel it is my responsibility to speak out about what I saw, to be an activist and as a writer, um, to, to bear witness to the truth that I saw um, through, in this case, Rebecca's eyes. Um, so a lot of responsibility comes with that privilege, absolutely. Um, and it, it's part of why I describe myself in the way that I do is not just as a writer, but as also as an activist. And uh, Nora? Well, when I first uh, became involved uh, with Palestine in the way old days, like before and during the first Intifada, uh, there were so few foreigners there. I think Palestinians all knew if you're there, you're there in solidarity. So right. it really wasn't a question or a concern either about being American or being Jewish at pretty much any point. Um, but... I'll, I'll interrupt you, Nora, to say um, I, I think it's a really important point um, because I recall that very well because all the careerists and opportunists, if we can call them that politely, um, came uh, much later. But nevertheless, the reason I interrupted you is because you have this very humorous um, anecdote in the introduction um, uh, to your book where you're trying to cross uh, the Manada, the main square in Palestine. Um, because it's being obstructed by Israeli soldiers on, on top of one of the main buildings. And when you explain to a passerby, you know, um, or you ask for his assistance and he asks you where you're from and you say you're American, he says, well, you're the reason you're having this issue. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't mean uh, when I say I, you know, I felt welcome and, and totally comfortable in Palestine in the early days. I don't mean that folks didn't know what the U.S. was doing and consider me uh, to have a responsibility to educate and advocate and be active uh, for a change in U.S. policy. Of course they did. But um, the fantasy that some people have here in the United States that a Jew is going to be uh, singled out or threatened or that it would be dangerous, it, it, there is just not at any point in my 35 plus years of experience that I felt uh, uncomfortable uh, as a Jew. Now, you raised the important point that I wanted to make about the difference between being a foreigner in the old days where everyone knows you're there in solidarity and being a foreigner now where it's so important that I, for example, distinguish myself from those uh, international aid actors who are careerists, opportunists, who are uh, there uh, for, for uh, their own advancement, financial or career advancement. Um, so I think that being a, a foreigner has a, 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 a credible and, and a genuine, a genuine, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's much more complicated now. You have to really uh, distinguish yourself. Um, that still being said, the, the major problem that I have being a Jew is as Allison said, it's not with Palestinians, it's with Jews in the United States, uh, yeah. also with Israelis, but I'm here now where um, the whole discussion um, and the whole weaponization of anti-Semitism is being wielded both against Palestinians and other Palestinian solidarity activists, but very, very much against Jews like me who are uh, who identifies anti-Zionist. And um, these uh, attacks are, and, 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 and the definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism is actually being used 
to try to define folks like me out of Judaism. Well, that that's I'm, I'm glad you raised that point because that was going to be my um, uh, next question, which is how you've experienced the current campaign by Israel and its apologists to de delegitimize any opposition um, to its actions and policies, including, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, by Jews as anti-Semitism. And um, I wanted to ask not only what you um, think of this campaign, but whether it's affected you personally. And Nora, you're basically saying this is this campaign is being kind of used, for lack of a better term, to excommunicate you. Yeah, that's what I feel. I mean, um, the if they say, which they do say, that to attack Israel is to attack Jews, mm -hmm. they, what they mean by that is that Israel is an expression of Judaism. So right. then what am I? Right? I'm like... I, uh, well, if you're anti-Zionist, you can't be a Jew. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it's really, I think, when we look back 10, 20, 30 years from now, I think we'll look now at this, uh, these forces as a turning point, not just in Palestinian history, but in Jewish history. Could you expand on that a little? I think the 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 idea. Hmm, how do I say this? Um, the idea that I am less of a Jew or a bad Jew because I believe in equality and human rights and dignity for Palestinians is so offensive and so evil um it 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 can't but drive a wedge between jews it's it's just too uh it's it's it can't we can't we can't exist as a, this this is too big of a rift to have this community stay together this way especially when the um jewish identified institutions you know, authorize them, themselves to speak on behalf of all Jews, just like Israel also authorizes itself to speak on behalf of all Jews. And Allison, um, what are what are your thoughts and experiences in this? Sure. Regard? Um, well, I would I mean, my own personal experience uh, is um, I mean, I think most of the negative reactions that I get these days uh, because I'm I'm not part of a religious community, you know, in terms of religiously being observant, um, are just, you know, random social media abuse, things that I'm sure Palestinians experience in a, a, a much more dangerous level. But I would just point, for example, just this past weekend's New York Times Sunday Magazine had a, a, a long essay uh, or a, a long article report about rabbinical students who are speaking out against Israeli policies. Um, they issued a very powerful letter during the most recent attack on Gaza in May, you know, calling the situation apartheid, speaking in terms of, of human rights abuses, et cetera. And the backlash, backlash against them, you know, rabbinical students, was swift and fierce. Um, and one couple examples from the article, you know, immediately, one of the um, one of the students' um, necessary internships to complete the course as a rabbi, as I understood it, was revoked. Um, and there was this amazing quote um, from an older rabbi who said, "If I die tomorrow, may none of the signatories of this letter take my place." I mean, it, it just it, it's it's very amazing, um, and in many respects. But I think. I'd like to sort of frame this in a larger way. I think the really important point to understand about these personal slanders, whether they're against Jews or non-Jews, uh, and the weaponization of anti-Semitism, which, by the way, only weakens the struggle against real anti-Semitism, um, 
which is really rooted in white supremacy in its most lethal form, I say, is changing the conversation. Uh, people who support Israel's policies, um, they cannot win when the conversation is centered on what is really happening on the ground. That no credible observer of that can cannot say the Israelis are the occupiers. It's the Palestinians who have this, you know, legitimate struggle for freedom, dignity, equality, self determination, um, and the more apparent that is to the rest of the world, and I think it is becoming more apparent because of, you know, social media, films, etc. The the louder um, and more bold and obnoxious these attempts to distract must become right so um so here we find ourselves in this you know today in this situation with these you know orwellian definitions of anti-semitism as, as nora was saying um and you know legal actions that really turn civil and human rights work on its head um, accusations of terrorism against ice cream companies. I mean, on some level, it's it's ridiculous and almost laughable, except that it's I believe <laughs> these tactics are steadily making their way into the deeper fabric, political and social fabric of this country and many others. They're being normalized, these tactics. Right. Um, and I think, I mean, it's becoming very clear that activists, um, writers, et cetera, in this, in this country are beginning to suffer in the same way that those who have been Palestinian activists for a long time have. Um, and, you know, another point I would make is that Israel has a history of pioneering instruments of repression. And, and that's not to say that this country and the rest of the world doesn't have a bloody history of repression. God knows that's true. Um, but I think that Israel has kind of carved out its own special niche in this way that from which it profits quite handsomely politically and financially. And, you know, you can trace this back to their pioneering use of drones, killer drones in particular, the support that they gave to apartheid South Africa in developing its nuclear program, the support for repressive bloody regimes in Central and South America, right? So Certain light unto the nations. <laughs> a light unto the nations in ways you can hardly imagine. So, you know, I think it's important to think of this in, in very broad terms uh, because this isn't just about personal ramifications for individuals, although that happens and it's abhorrent. It's about a larger political development, uh, societal development that I think we really need to start paying attention to. Well, on, on that note, um, one reason I was so interested to uh, speak with both of you is because I think it's fair to say that um, for people of, of your generation and your background, uh, your personal and political trajectories are quite unusual um, and, and um, not easily found. Whereas if you look at the current generation up and coming, um, it would be perhaps even um, more difficult to find people who are your mirror opposites, that's an exaggeration, but I, I'm wondering whether you draw hope from seeing what appears to be the very significant um, transformation um, over the course of, you know, um, uh, one generation um, and, and attitudes to these issues to which you've uh, devoted so much of your um, uh, life and activism. Um, Nora, maybe to start with you. Um, I'm sure uh, Allison will have much more to say on this. I am a little bit heartened by being able to speak 
a little bit more freely. I'm not even sure I believe what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I, I, I see and I read and I hear that younger people and including younger Jews are engaging more with criticism of Zionism and understanding uh, history better. But I really want to see that translated into political action. Um, I, I want uh, Palestinians and Arabs to be fully considered within anti-racist movements, not marginalized or second class. Um, and I don't know, I just, it's a little too soon for me, for me to be quite that hopeful, mm. but maybe soon. One hopes, and 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 you, Allison, um, your thoughts. Well, and my sure. If, um, so if you if you compare, you know, your generation to your uh, daughters, do you see kind of a an important shift uh, underway? Yeah, I think maybe because I was trained as a historian, I I take a longer view, and you know, I think about um, as a college student, you know, decades ago. Um, it was, I mean, you couldn't even use the word Palestinian really uh, without struggling for the, uh, and that becoming the issue. Or, I mean, I'm sure you both know this, this story. I mean, Noam Chomsky used to have to have an armed guard. I think the same thing for Edward Said after Fox, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, maybe. Um, and now it's it's really I mean in many ways the struggle for rights for Palestinian rights has become a kind of cause celeb on college campuses. Right. Um, it, it's I think in many ways it is has been integrated or is integrating into other um, movements for social justice, and that's by and large because of young. Palestinian grassroots activists and their allies. Um, I, um, it, it doesn't mean though that the fight's over, right? I, I mean, I always remind myself of the Frederick Douglass quote, um, I hope I get it right, power concedes nothing without a fight. And, and that's that's his to me. That's the course without of without a demand. I think if I'm not without a demand. Yeah, yeah, I always get that part wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and that's that's our charge, right? Those of us who have seen and cannot unsee. Those of us who feel it's our responsibility, whether you're a Jew or not, to to speak up. Those of us who you know, like Nora, comes from a uh, a family of anti-racist and social justice activists. Um, this is part of that history. And, you know, I do think that we have to recognize whether or not it will change in a couple of years. I mean, we have people in the halls of Congress who are saying this is apartheid, who are That's saying- That's a very significant change. We need, you know, we're not, going to, um, who are advocating for cutting aid to Israel. You know, what happened to, uh, is it NGO that the spyware company uh, being blacklisted? I NSO. Mean, yeah. NSO, sorry. Uh, NGO, NSO. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll let that one go. Um, you know, those are significant shifts that, that sure. and I think that we need to, to give credit where credit is due, but to do so with with clear a clear-eyed vision of the future. Well, on, on that hopeful yet sobering note, um, Alison Glick, Nora Lester Murad, I'd like to thank you um, for appearing on Connections and sharing your um, personal and political stories. And, and thank you for what's been a really fascinating uh, and interesting conversation. Thank you very much. And I just uh, also like to uh, remind our viewers that uh, next week, 
on um, the 18th of November. We will be speaking with um, Kosmida, specialist on populism and the far right. Thank you once again. Bye-bye.